using for debt, and we're going to start investing it. Instead of working for our money, letting our money work for us, we took a look at that. And then last week, last week we talked about the tithe, didn't we? we talked about some of our stolen vehicles and such. I don't know what I'm talking about because we're stealing from God. We looked at that. So that's kind of reviewing. But the thing is, is when you do a message like this, anytime you start talking about money, all of us have questions regarding money. There's so many questions out there about what should I do in this situation? What should I do in that situation? And a money series like that raises a lot of questions regarding money, regarding tithes, regarding debts, regarding investments. So today, instead of our normal message, it's not going to be a normal, normal message today. I'm not going to be doing a lot of preaching. Today I'm going to be doing more teaching. I'm going to take some of those questions and answer them today. So if you'll notice in your worship guide, Greg did this week, he's got an extra insert in there for you to take notes, all right? You can take notes, the questions are listed that we're going to be answering, and you can take notes on the back page, on the front page, there's an extra spot in there for you to take notes because these are really practical lessons regarding finances in our lives. Now, before we get started, I do want to go to the Lord in a word of prayer because teaching or not, y'all don't need me teaching you, you need me anointed with the Holy Spirit to be teaching you. So let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we come before You right now thankful for this day, thankful for the rain that You're providing, Lord, to, to just grow the crops that are in the fields, Lord. We know that last year there were so many droughts. Lord, we don't want to see that again this year, so we thank You for the rain that You're providing early today. And we thank You for the rain of blessings that You poured out in our life, namely through Your Son, Jesus, and the fact that we are redeemed, we are made whole, we are saved, Father, and we are thankful, we are so thankful that You've made that provision, Lord. For us to know you through your son Jesus. Father, today I pray that even though it's not a normal preaching engagement, Lord, we're just doing some more relaxed teaching today. I pray that you will anoint me with your spirit and proclaim your truth through me today, Lord. And I pray that their hearts will be soft and that their hands will be fast to write these notes because we're going to go through it fast, Lord. And I pray that we'll be able to keep up and that they'll be able to use these answers practically in their lives so that they no longer have to be in debt, so they no longer have to be strapped, so they no longer have to be slaves to money. Father, we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The first question that we're going to talk about, and this is a really, really, really common question that people frequently ask, it's on your worship guide, is am I throwing money away by renting a home instead of owning Am I throwing money away by renting instead of owning? We say, you know, I'm just living there. There's, there's nothing coming back. I'm not making any equity. Am I throwing money away? And the answer is really no. Not necessarily. You are not wasting money by renting. There are times when it actually is better to be renting than it is to be buying. There are times when it's better. One of those times is if you're looking to buy more than you can afford, you need to be renting something. Don't be ending up like the people a few years back, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, all of that, where they went into stuff above their heads and they ended up losing their homes and foreclosures trying to get into things bigger more than what they needed. They needed to be renting somewhere and saving. Another time is buying before you're ready. See, you need to be saving. You need to be putting a little money up. You want to put down quite a bit when you go to buy a home. Some of us have gotten locked into 30-year mortgages, and we shouldn't have done that. Really, anytime you buy a home, you should really be putting down 20% on your home. Really, 20% on your home. And then getting into a fixed-rate 15-year mortgage so that you only have to pay it off for 15 years. And if you're able to save up and put that type of money down because you've applied the principles we talked about and gotten out of debt, you can save that money, and then you can put it down on a home you will have that house paid for with minimal payments on a 15-year loan. You will have it paid for very, very quickly. Another time is if you don't have that emergency fund we talked about. I remember the emergency fund, the $1,000 emergency fund. Because here's the deal. When you're renting, you have a landlord. It's his responsibility to fix, fix things. Well, when you're buying, as us homeowners know, your roof's going to leak. You've got to take care of that yourself. Or it's going to be the middle of summer. It's going to be 120 degrees outside. The humidity is going to be at 99.9%. .9%. It's going to be hotter than two squirrels in a wool sock. And you're going to be sweating when your AC goes out. Nice, huh? You're going to be sweating when that AC goes out. And if you don't have that emergency fund to pay for it, life will be miserable. 
It will be miserable. And as your wife is miserable, she's making you miserable, and you're making her miserable. If you can't afford emergencies when they happen, you do not need to be buying them. And another time, sometimes we buy knowing that we're going to sell or move. We're just buying for a temporary time. But here's what happens. It seems like it's a good idea. Buy, make a little money off the equity. But real, the reality is, is with closing costs, everything you put into it, all the fees that go with it, in the first three years, you are not going to make any equity whatsoever. You're going to lose money if you sell within three years. You can look at the studies and see people that buy and sell within three years and let's say boss bought a home and foreclosed or something like that, got it at a really, really, really good deal and then fixed it up. People that just buy and sell, if they haven't done that, they always lose money. So sometimes it is better to rent than to buy. Y'all need to know that. Another question, and this is a big one. We had a lot of a lot of youth that sold out church. Should I go into debt to go to school? Should I take out a school loan? I think the bigger question here really should be, do I need to go into debt, period? Do I need to go into debt? Well, the Bible says that if you're in debt, you're in bondage. It doesn't say that you're in sin. It says you're in bondage. It's not sin to go into debt. So know that, yes, you can go into debt, but the question is, do you really need to? The Bible tells us in Deuteronomy 23, 19, don't charge interest to believers. Well, that means that you can lend money and believers can receive money, so it's okay to lend, it's okay to borrow, but you must pay your debts. Um, it says in Psalms 37, 21, the wicked don't pay back. The wicked don't pay back. We don't want to be wicked, so if we do borrow, we want to pay back. But we're talking about school loans right here. So should I take out a school loan? If you have to. But try not to. Try to get a scholarship. We all know that. Scholarships. There are grants available that you don't have to repay. Try to get a grant. Take out a second job. Remember I talked about in the first week about having roommates, 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 so you don't have a lot of expenses, so that you don't have to take out this big school loan. Try not to take out loans. Really, guys, especially you, you try not to take out these loans because you saw a few weeks ago all the ones that were still paying off school loans, raising their hands, wishing they didn't have those school loans. It's okay, but try not to. And if you do, borrow as little as possible and then pay it back as fast as possible. Remember the principle of the debt snowball that we talked about. Pay it back as soon as you can. Get rid of that debt. Another question that people frequently have is, I can't start a small business without going into debt. I cannot start a small business without going into debt. Here's the thing that we have to look at. We have to be realistic if we're wanting to be a business owner. 90% of businesses fail within the first five years. 90% of businesses fail within the first five years. So if you are taking out a loan, if you're taking out a loan to start a business, you need to know that you're putting yourself at a great risk of going into debt. You need to know that. It's something that you have to address before you go to start a business. Now, there are some things that you can do. You can start an LLC, a limited liability corporation, or you can start an S-Corp. And if you don't know what an S-Corp is, you probably don't need to start a business, okay? If any of you are thinking about starting a business, and you don't know what that is, it's a bad idea, all right? Now, there are some ways to start a business without going into debt. You can get investors. That's one way to do it. Get investors. Look for people that will find what it is that you're wanting to do. You can save up until you can take care of it yourself. You don't have to go into debt to start a business. But if you do, remember it's a bad idea potentially because most businesses fail. I know that here in America we have this great entrepreneurial spirit. We want to start businesses. We want to be self-employed. We want to be a self-made man. But you need to remember as believers that we aren't self-made. We're made by God. So we need to trust Him and trust His will for our life and try not to go into debt like this, okay? A great, great question. And I know every single one of us has known somebody or even thought about it ourselves if we have a lot of debt is as a Christian. As a believer, is it okay to go into bankruptcy? Let me just see a consensus from y'all. Who thinks as a believer it's okay to go into debt? Or into bankruptcy? Nobody thinks it's okay? So if you think it's not okay to go into bankruptcy as a believer, let me see your hands. 
Should see every hand now, or y'all being very unresponsive today. All right, <laughs> here's the thing. The Bible says the wicked borrow and do not repay, but the righteous give generously. That's Psalm 37, 21. I was talking about it a while ago. Some are going to use this to build a case about bankruptcy. But you can't use one verse to build a case. You cannot use that one verse. We really need to look at a bigger picture of what the Bible says about debt. If you look in Leviticus chapter 25, in verse or chapter 25 and chapter 27, you'll see what's called the year of Jubilee. And in the year of Jubilee, it was every 50th year, they would cancel debts, people would get back the property that belonged to them. Because what is the message of the Bible? It's grace and forgiveness. If we look in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 1 through 2, and I want you to look at this, every seventh year, Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 1 through 2, every seventh year they had what was called the year of canceling debt. Because people would go into debt, maybe their crops weren't yielding fruit, they would have to go into they would have to take out loans to survive. You know, borrowing other people's stuff, borrowing other people's crops, living off other people's stuff. They would have to do this. And every seven years, because God did not want us to be oppressed and poor, He set it up, but we're not, we're not as wise as Him and we don't trust His ways, we trust our ways. But God set it up for every seventh year to cancel all debts. Now, there's actually nothing in the Bible that, that verifies that the children of Israel ever did the year of Jubilee like they were supposed to nor the year of canceling debts. We don't see where they ever actually did it because we don't listen to what God is telling us to do. But if we would listen to Him, we would see that there is times when it's okay to cancel debts. So there are a lot of Christian attorneys out there. A lot of them will say it is okay to go into bankruptcy. It is okay to go into bankruptcy. They'll say particularly if you've done a few things. If you've liquidated all of your assets, if you've liquidated all of your assets, to try to pay off your debt. At that point in time, you can go into bankruptcy. They say, if you're not hiding any assets, because some people actually do file bankruptcy and they're hiding assets, they still have money. That is wrong, wrong, wrong. And as believers, we should never do that. If we're going to go into bankruptcy, we need to have liquidated everything. We don't need to be hiding any assets. And we need to have done everything possible. Everything possible to pay the debt that we owe before we make the decision to go into bankruptcy. Now, I will tell you also, because I don't want you to think that, oh yes, I definitely should go into bankruptcy. You do need to know that there are some, a few, a few, most of most Christian attorneys say you can, but there are a few Christian attorneys who say you should not, you should not go into bankruptcy. They say it's far too easy to file, and it's too easy to try to run away from your stuff, and people never try to pay off the debt even after they file bankruptcy. So what really all of them are agreeing on is you need to pay it off whether you file for bankruptcy or not. The thing is, is if you do file for bankruptcy, they're not going to be chasing after you. You have, it's really a free, you have more freedom to pay them back. They're not chasing, they're not locking down everything. You can pay them back on your time, but you should pay them back. Remember, the wicked borrow and do not repay. So either way, whether you file it or not, you still need to pay back what you owe. Bankruptcy does not mean, oh, I'm done with it. You still need to pay it back. You still need to pay it back. A good question that um, a lot of us ask, I thought about it before when I had my debt, when I owed a lot of money to North Carolina, is um, should we pay cash for home improvements or get a home equity loan to benefit from the tax deductions? Because when we take out that home equity loan, you know, then, then we get these tax breaks, but you need to know that the tax breaks aren't always what you think they are. They don't always work the way that you think that they're going to work. You'll take out this home equity loan, you'll think that this tax break is going to really help you out, but it usually does not. So if you're wanting a pool at your house, I would like to have a pool. If you're wanting a pool at your house, if you're wanting to remodel your kitchen, you've got a small kitchen, you need more cabinet space, if you want to do some things in your bedroom, you need a bigger bed, you, you, you want to rearrange everything, don't do this. Don't take out that home equity loan. Don't do it. It's not going to work out the way you think it's going to work. Save up. Swim in your debt-free pool. Eat in your debt-free kitchen. And do whatever in, in your debt-free bedroom, all right? Save up and pay for this. Um, right now, though, because I'm really not a financial expert, I'm not... My finances are good. I, I don't owe money. I, I'm out of debt. But I'm not a financial expert. But there is a believer in Christ out there who's made his life 
Um, what he does is he makes it known to people about finances. He helps people overcome debt. And, you know, I've talked about Pastor Craig Rochelle at Life Church before, and that this series, Strapped, is actually a Life Church series. Well, when they did it, because Pastor Craig is way more famous than I, and he knows way more people than I do, he actually had the opportunity to sit down with Dave Ramsey, the Christian financial guru. He had the opportunity to sit down with him and ask him some questions about finances. So right now, I'm going to turn it over on video for a few minutes to Pastor Craig and Dave Ramsey talking. Dave, thanks a ton for taking time to help us with Strath. We love you at our church, and you've been a great friend and mentor to me. Let's dive right in. Uh, Dave, you recommend several baby steps that have been helpful to people all over the world. Can you give us the Reader's Digest version of what are the baby steps that you recommend financially? Absolutely. Well, I'm honored to be with you. Thank you for including me in this. It wouldn't be right if we didn't do this. That's I mean, right. I just thank you Got to so get much. the Dave in. Um, I'm, I'm honored. Um, the baby steps are our way of applying God's principles that are in Scripture of handling money. Baby step one is $1,000 cash in the bank. It's the first thing you do, a little starter emergency fund. Two is the debt snowball. That's where you list your debts smallest to largest, pay minimum payments on everything but the little one, and attack the little one with a vengeance, work your way right down through them. You'll get momentum emotionally that way, and hope will kick in, and it allows you to get through the debt. Then when you're finished with all your debt except your home, you move on to baby step three, which is three to six months of expenses, a fully funded grandma's rainy day fund. Then we do baby steps four, five, and six at the same time. Four is 15% of your income going into retirement. Five is if you have kids at home that you're saving for college, it's kids college. And six is all the extra money then goes at the house. And we're seeing people pay off their homes doing the total money makeover or financial piece in about seven years average, some longer, some shorter. That brings us to baby step seven. There's nothing left to do then but become very wealthy and give a bunch of it away. And this stuff absolutely works, hands down, no doubt about it. Absolutely. Uh, Lisa asked, should I withdraw money from my 401k to pay off $9,200 worth of credit card debt? Absolutely not. Under no circumstances would you do that. Now, my rule of thumb on withdrawing from the 401k is to avoid a bankruptcy or a foreclosure. I can't think of a case where there's a bankruptcy over 9200 Not a chance. Because here's what happens. When you pull money out of the 401k, the government, the IRS, charges you a 10% penalty plus your tax rate. So if you're in a 30% tax bracket, that's a 40% Hit. So, Lisa, that's kind of like asking me, hey, Dave, I want to borrow 40 money at 40% interest to pay off my 9200 eh, Don't do that. So, Eric asked the question. He said, I'm 39 years old. I have three kids. I make $56,000 a year. He wanted to know how much life insurance should he get, and should he buy term life insurance or whole life insurance? Okay. Second question first, never buy anything but term insurance. I'll never do investing inside of an insurance policy. You can see the lessons are my books for all the reasons, but always do your investing somewhere else. So 15 to 20 year level term insurance. Think about how old those kids, they'll be grown and gone in 15 years, okay, most of them. Maybe 20 years at the most. And you need about 10 times your income or 12 times your income on you. So let's say he's making $56,000 a year, he gets $600,000. He passes away, God forbid, we're all gonna pass away someday, and, but he passes away while the kids still need the money, the wife still needs the money. She could take 600000 invest it. If she makes 10% or so on her money, she's making 60000 without touching the nest egg. Well, we've replaced you. So don't buy too much insurance. You have to sleep with one eye open. In previous weeks, I talked about uh, the possibility of investing in maybe earning a 12% return. I used that in examples. And Terry said... He likes me and he's a Dave Ramsey fan, but he said 12% is impossible. Those days are gone. Mm. What do you think? Well, I, I think that Terry is probably a, a young person who has lost his hope and lost his vision and doesn't believe America is gonna be great. Uh, there's, you know, how does he know what the future holds? I don't know what the future holds. The only way I can judge investment returns are based on what they've done in the past. When I opened up a particular envelope in my home the other day and pulled out the prospectus of a mutual fund I own, opened in 1934, the average annual return since 1934 was 11.9%. That mutual fund last year made over 14%. So I'm not sure where Terry's getting his investment advice, but I, I, I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm not saying it'll always happen because that mutual fund had some down years too when the market was down. But overall, an average of 12%, there's no way you can tell me it, absolutely with certainty it can't happen in the future. That's someone who's given up on the future. 
Well, speaking of mutual funds, you've talked about those for years and helped me learn how to invest in them. Can you tell us what's your philosophy and how would you advise someone who's starting to invest in mutual funds for the first time? To start with, don't put money in something because Dave Ramsey said to, or even Craig Rochelle said to, okay? Put money in something because you understand it. God gave you that responsibility. And, and if you were managing something for me and you put money in it and you, didn't, you couldn't tell me anything about it, well, I wouldn't be happy with you. And God's the same way. He wants you to be faithful to know what you're putting the money into. Now, we suggest you put money in four types of mutual funds and spread it across those four in your Roth IRAs, your 401ks, and that's growth, growth and income, aggressive growth and international. My personal 401k is invested that way, a fourth in each of those. Okay, great advice, Dave. Um, Caitlin and Robbie, they're married, they just had their first baby, and they wanna know where and how should they start investing for college? Oh, that's so fun. Well, to start with, make sure you've gotten your debt out of the way and you have your emergency fund in place and we're walking those baby steps. You got 15% going into retirement. But then once you're ready to do college, the first $2,000 a year you invest, we recommend the ESA, stands for Educational Savings Account. It's kind of the Roth IRA of the college world because it grows tax free. The first $2,000 per year per child should go into that. You can select almost any mutual fund, and if you decide you don't like the mutual fund, just like an IRA, you can roll it over to another one. You've got total control of it, total say-so over it, and that's the first money I would put in. That's $166.67 a month per child. That can amount to a lot right there. Great answer, Dave. <laughs> uh, Adrian and her husband just got out of debt, and they want to purchase their first home. How much money should they put down and what's the length of the loan that you would recommend? Well, of course, I like the 100% down plan. Uh, that's my favorite, but not everybody's going to be willing to wait that long and it's not realistic maybe for some people. I don't borrow money, so I have to be consistent with my advice and not be hypocritical. It's the one area that I will tell you to, that it might be okay to do something I'm not doing. So we're okay with mortgages as long as you don't take out more than a 15-year fixed rate mortgage where the payment is no more than a fourth of your take-home pay. And how much put down? As much as you can, because we want to turn around and pay it off as fast as possible. But again, always be debt-free and always have an emergency fund plus your down payment when you buy. Because if you buy a home with a bunch of debt, you know, you got Sally Mae, you got to buy an extra bedroom for her. You know, you, you got MasterCard around. He's telling you what to do when the water heater breaks. And you don't want all this stuff going on in your life. So you shouldn't buy a home when you're broke. It'll make you broker. I'm so glad I turned it over to Dave because that stuff was way over my head. That's way over my head. Dave is the man when it comes to finances, and I advise every one of you to start reading Dave Ramsey stuff. Check out Financial Peace, um, and we're gonna, he's going to talk a little bit about Financial Peace in a little bit. We're going to go back to Dave in a few minutes. Um, but I really, really think that if you are, you are in a situation where money is holding you back, that Dave Ramsey is a great source to utilize if you're wanting to become unstrapped. He's got some great principles. As you can see, a lot of what we've been talking about are, are things that Dave Ramsey suggests himself. So um, the next question I want to do, and I, I've heard this one. I've been asked this one. Should we stop tithing to get out of our debt? Should we stop tithing to get out of our debt? And if you were here last week, that you know this, this is a ridiculous question right here. We don't want to be stealing from God. The answer to this question certainly is no. No. We can see it in Exodus 23, 19. You can see it in Malachi 3, 10. Matthew 23, 23. Tithing is giving God our first and our best. So He can bless the rest. So let him bless the rest to get you out of debt. Don't steal from God to pay off your debt, all right? Don't do it. The answer is no. Um, another question, and Joe and I had been talking about this one. Should I tithe off my tax return? Should I tithe off my tax return? Any guesses on this one? The answer is it depends. It really depends. If you've been tithing off the gross all year, if you've been tithing off the gross amount, then you've already tithed off of that income. There's no need to tithe off of your income tax return. Except, there's always I before E, except after you. <coughs> Even if you were tithing off your gross, but you're in a family like mine or Joe's and you're eligible for things like earned income credit, 
child tax credits, these are not things that we've given tithes on because that's not a part of our income. So if you have been tithing off your gross, but at the end of the year when you file your taxes, when you get your tax return, whatever your earned income credit and your child tax credit was, yes, you should tithe off of that portion. You should. And if you've been tithing off of your net, if you've been tithing off your net, what you bring home, then yes, again, you need to tithe on your tax return because you have not already tithed off of that income. You let the government have first and you did not give to God first, so you need to give it back when you get your tax return. Um, one thing I want to talk about with tax returns real quick, um, because I, I saw this guy, you know, it's, it's income tax time of year, and I was in Walmart the other night, and I just want to tell you, if you are in debt, if you are in debt, don't be wasting your income tax return. Don't do it. I'm in Walmart, and I see this guy, I was back in the back section, and you know, he's, he's buying an otter box. And, you know, Derek's all about saving money. And Amazon.com has become my best friend. And I found out, referred Greg to it, like, hey, get it from Amazon. Um, I got my otter box on Amazon for 20 bucks at Walmart, 50 bucks. There's no way I'm going to spend 30 extra dollars for something I can get for 20. So I see this guy, he's in Walmart, and he's getting an otter box. And I, I want to rescue, you know, that, that's my nature. I got I to gotta run over there. Hey, dude, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. You can get a lot cheaper. So I run over there to him, and I'm, I'm like, hey, um, I see you're buying an otter box, man. And I'm not trying to get in your business or nothing, you know, but I just want to let you know that that thing's like 50 bucks. And if you don't have to have it today, you can get that thing on Amazon for 20 bucks. He was like, really? I was like, yeah, man. He was like, dude, I appreciate it. But the thing is, man, is, you know, and normally I can't afford one to begin with, but I just got my income tax return. So, I mean, I'm not even worried about it right now. I'm just going to go ahead and get it. I'm like, are you kidding me? You normally don't have the 50 bucks to get one to begin with, so you think it's a great idea right now when you normally don't have a lot of money, you've got some extra money to just blow it? Ladies and gentlemen, when you get your income tax returns, do not waste that money. Apply it to your debts. Get out of debt so that if you will live right now like no one else, even though everyone else is buying their 50-inch plasmas, in it, if you will live like no one else, then later on you can give like no one else. So don't use it just exorbitantly on things you don't need. Take care of these things we've been talking about so that you can be unstrapped. Unstrapped. Another question is should I tithe off my school loans? Because it's an income, right? Did you tithe when you bought your house? When you borrowed $100,000 to buy your house? No. Because you don't tithe off of borrowed money. That's not an income. No, you do not tithe off of your school loans. Should we get a home equity loan to pay off our credit cards that have a much higher interest rate? Makes sense, right? Get this home equity loan, you'll pay it back at like 4 or 5%. You got this credit card, it's got this astronomical rate, maybe 18.9, 23.5. It's got this really high interest rate. It makes sense to take out a loan where you're paying less, but here's the reality. It's not the interest rate that's killing us, it's our spending habits. It's our spending habits. And even though it makes sense on paper, most people who do this end up losing out. They end up in debt again because they never change their spending habits. Yeah, their debt has a lower interest rate, but they go right back into debt. You don't need to do that. You need to work on your spending habits. Look at the things you need. Do you have to have that Starbucks every day? Do you have to have that SUV when you don't even have kids? Do you have to have that? Look at your spending habits. Don't, don't take off a home equity or take out a home equity loan to, to take care of an interest or, or a car with an interest rate that's higher. A question that I debated and debated about, man, because this one can really raise a lot of steam. Do I want to, do I want to talk about this one? And it's not on your sheets. I left it off there because I didn't know if I wanted to talk about it. But what happens when you're married and your husband is not a believer? And he does not want you to tithe. Should you tithe at that point? What do you think? You tithe your own. Okay. Anybody else want to want to so give, give some thoughts? Your you, you, do we think that we should tithe when our husband says no? 
here's where we're at. In this situation, and I pray that y'all don't take advantage of this. Your heart better be right in this situation if you're going to do what I, what I advise. Either way, you can be right if your heart is in the right place. Because the Bible does tell us don't steal from God to time. It does. But the Bible also tells us to submit to our husbands, doesn't it? It says don't steal, but it tells us to submit to our husbands. And I want to take a look at a verse in Peter, okay? It's the only thing I can come up with this, for this question to give an answer that even remotely makes sense. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words, but by the behavior of their wives. By the behavior of their wives. So, if you if tithing is really about the heart, it's about trusting God. Okay, that's why we do it. We're saying I trust you, but we're also supposed to submit to our husbands. One could say that it's sin, and you cannot submit to sin. We should never do anything illegal, immoral, unethical, or sinful, right? But Scripture saying submit so that if they do not believe the word, that means even for those that are non-believers, we should still submit to them. So on this one, it's a very personal answer that I can't give you. That's why I didn't want to address it. I can't give you a real answer. It could go either way. You need to trust the conviction that the Holy Spirit places upon you. I would suggest that if it's causing a fight in your home, if it's causing anything bad, you probably just need to submit to Him and not do it. The best thing to do, though, is exactly what Steve said. Exactly. Talk to Him. Say, this is my income. I made this. And I want to be right with God. I want to be right with God, so I'm going to tithe. And explain to Him that the reason our finances are all jacked up is because we're not finding favor with God because you're stealing from Him. Jack. <laughs> just saying. Throw it out there and let Him know. But I do believe that either way, because you're under His spiritual covering, that it can go either way. Tough question. I know y'all don't like my answer. It's kind of a politician's answer. But it's the best I can do because I honestly don't know. I'm Pastor Derek, but I'm not God, and I don't have all of the answers, okay? I think we should submit, but I also think we should tithe. I know that the Holy Spirit will convict us of what to do in that situation. So if you're in that situation, pray it out and determine what God would have you do in that situation, okay? I shouldn't have addressed that one, huh? Hey. <laughs> Bad answer? God is going to take care of the 90% better. He, he's not going to miss it, but you still have to submit. You're, you're a husband, so you don't know nothing about it. These wives know something about it. And if there's any wives in here that have a husband that's not a believer, and they're wanting to tithe, and their husband's not saying that they can't, they're living it every day. But we're not. So it, it's not a bad answer. Because those wives, they're going through it. They're, they're going through it. I was in the opposite position. My wife was tithing, and I was not. And I repeat that. But her income, she do what she wants to My income, she did that. And again, that is your situation. Now, some husbands forbid their wives to tithe. You have to understand that. I've been asked personally this question. That's the only reason I'm addressing it. I really didn't want to touch this. But because I have been asked, Derek, what should I do? I felt obligated by the Spirit. I can answer or not that I needed to speak so that the Spirit could speak to the believer in question so they can deal with it. But say, my wife is doing it, and I've seen my wife. So, well, and, and they can use that. They can say, hey, Steve did it, and you know, God bless him, and now Steve has actually come to know the Lord, and it can be a ministry opportunity for a person in that situation. Um, what is the best way to correct your wife when she spends too much money? Keep your mouth shut. So I got one saying backhand, and I got one saying keep your mouth shut. If you want my answer, very, very gently. That's it. I'm moving on. No, seriously. I think that the best thing to do if your wife is spending too much money, if you're handling the finances and she's spending too much money, because most wives that are handling the money don't spend too much because they know what they can and cannot spend. So most of the time when a wife is spending too much money, most of the time, it's because the husband is the one handling the money and they don't know. So what you want to do in this situation is sit down with your spouse 
sit down and go over the finances together. Show what's coming in, what's going out, set up a budget. Don't do it meanly. Don't go, hey, you need to sit down. We've got to talk about this right now. Sit down and say, hey, I want to look at our budget so that we can look at our future and how we can best serve God with our future, what the best route is for us. So I want to make sure that we're on the same page right now and sit down with them and go over that budget. That is the best way to handle this situation. And again, very, very gently. Not backhand, Joe. We're going to talk later. Should the husband always handle the finances? Yes. If he's better at it. No. If he's not. It depends on who's better. Some people have what's called the gift of administration, right? We see it in Scripture. It's a gift. And if hubby does not have that gift, but the missus does, let her administrate. Let her handle that, okay? Because you don't need to be going off buying things that you don't know if you can afford it or not. Because what do we talk about us guys do? We buy it all at once, don't we? Women, nickel and diamonds to death. Guys come on, man, you see my new Ford truck? I mean, guys, if you can't manage money and she can, let her do it. Scripture doesn't say one way or the other is sin. It does not say it. So, Whichever is better is the one that should be handling the finances. Another question is, my wife and I have separate bank accounts. Is that wrong? My wife and I have separate bank accounts. Is that wrong? Let me think. You know, it's increasingly common to have separate bank accounts, particularly in second marriages. We see it all the time, people having separate bank accounts. And I want you to know that if you have separate bank accounts, you have a risk. I can't say that it's sin. Scripture doesn't say, Thou shalt not have separate bank accounts. But you need to know you have a greater risk of danger. Because in a marriage, what's mine is yours, and what's yours is mine. What's mine is yours, and what's yours is mine. Two have become one. So anytime that there's mine and yours, you're at a greater risk of danger. You're giving the devil a foothold. We do not want to give the devil a foothold. So you need to understand that. Now, having said that, there are times when it makes a lot of sense to have separate bank accounts. Maybe saving up for a vacation. Not a separate bank account from your spouse, but a separate account from your primary one. Or maybe your spouse is a stay-at-home mom, but she's got a little home business doing Scentsy or Pampered Chef or something like this. At that point in time, you don't need the finances that she's putting into that getting mixed up with your primary finances. So if there's a home business going on, sure, separate bank accounts. There are times when it makes sense. But just remember, even in that situation, because your home business hopefully is going to be making some profit at some point, that profit should probably go into the joint primary account. Expenses, you keep the money in there, but probably put that profit in that joint account because what's mine is yours and what's yours is mine. We don't want to give the devil a foothold. Um, right now, right now, I am going to turn it back over to Dave and Craig because Dave has better answers than I. Um, but Dave didn't address that, that particular issue, that particular question, because it was asked to me personally. I felt the need to, didn't want to. Right now I'm going to turn it back over to the guys. I mean, Pastor Craig is the man in the world of ministry, and Dave Ramsey is the man in the world of finances. So I'm going to turn it over to better men than I am. Katie wanted to know, Katie wanted to know if her tithe should all go to the church or if she can give 10% and spread it out between family, her church, and other ministries that she likes? Well, again, the tithe, by definition, evangelicals for hundreds of years have pretty much agreed it's a local church thing. Now, there's lots of different brands and different ways of looking at things in Christianity, and I'm not upset about it, and I suspect God's not really upset about it. So quit looking for the details or the legal rules and get the principle. The principle is when you give, it changes you into a giver, thus making you more Christ-like. That's the big deal here. Now, again, evangelical teaching and what I do 
is your local church because the local church is the New Testament model of the Old Testament storehouse where the Levites were paid, they were the pastors, and, and where the widows and the orphans were taken care of. So your local church ought to be taking care of that single mom that's struggling, ought to be taking care of the widows, ought to be helping the poor, ought to be doing those things out of the tithe, and you need to, you need to hold them to that standard, but don't get all legalistic about it. I give a tenth of my income there, and I give a lot more to other things too. Great. Well, Mickey wanted to know, um, does the 10% is that before taxes or after taxes? Have you ever been asked that before? I have all the time. Yeah, I'm always asked before taxes or after taxes. I've always heard the cute answer, which one you want to be blessed on. You know, I like that one. That's, that's cute. the pastor's answer. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> you know, and I tithe on the gross uh, because I don't think taxes are what were meant in Deuteronomy when it says to give a tenth of your net increase. That applies to a business net profit before taxes. So I tithe on the gross. I've seen really good Bible studies that were convincing both ways. And the way I figured it is I'm kind of a simple guy. I'm going to tithe on the big one. That way when I get up there, if I'm wrong, I'm still okay. Well, Sam had a pretty serious question. He said he owes $22,000 on a car that's only worth $18,000. He's wanting to get out of debt. Do you have any advice for him? Absolutely. you got two options, Sam. One is take four extra jobs and pay that thing down to what, is, what it's worth so you can sell it. Or the other thing is find someone, a bank, a credit union, it might even be the bank that loaned you the money on the car, to loan you the $4,000 that you're in the hole. And so I'd rather have you $4,000 in debt than $22,000 in debt. But you've got to be able to cover that four in order to sell it. Because if I'm the buyer, I bring you a check for 18, the bank's not going to give you a title until you put the other four with it. So you've got to have that four figured out from somewhere. But I, I would figure that out and I would get out of that. That sounds like a trap to me. Dave, I had a ton of people trying to cut expenses and they don't quite know how. They'll say there's really not any room. Based on your experience all these years of helping people, what are some common ways of cutting expenses that a lot of people may not necessarily see? The biggest one's eating out. You know, you don't need to see the inside of a restaurant while you're getting out of debt unless you're working there. I mean, you just need to stay away from there. Eating at home is 80% cheaper than eating out. And, uh, you know, it, it's just ridiculous. And the, le and the, it, the more you cook from scratch versus pre-prepared in from the grocery store, you'll save that much more. Now, it's more labor intensive, obviously. It's also better for you. And, and so you get a better quality meal that way. That's a big, big one right there. And, and then the others are stuff like, you know, things we take for granted. We think vacations are like a necessity. They're not a necessity. You're not going on vacation. You're cleaning up your dad blame mess. And Christmas? I mean, I love Christmas. I mean, it's Jesus' birthday. I get that. But people have gone bananas at Christmas. And so, you know, Christmas, one year at our house, it was a craft. You know, I mean, it was, we were trying to get out of our mess. It's not hard. So, so you know, it's different things with different people. But, but sometimes it's, you, you can look at it. Here's what I have found. The more passionate you are about getting out of debt, the deeper you will sacrifice. Therefore, the faster you will get out. So there's a direct tie between the level of how fired up and wired up you are, game on, baby, and, and how quick we're going to get out. You'll find those things to cut, and you'll go to the other side and start adding income by working six jobs, man. I mean, you know, you work like a crazy person for a short period of time, work like no one else, so later you can work like no one else. That's so good. Uh, let's talk about the spiritual side of money. Uh, Darren from Sydney, Australia, he wanted to know, um, Dave, do you really think that God actually cares about what we do with our money? Well, the way I look at it is, I'm really sure that my Heavenly Father is a father, and He's really crazy about me. Now, I've got three kids. I want good things for my three kids. And the Bible says this, if we being evil know how to give our children good gifts, how much more so our Father in Heaven. Now, He's not concerned about money, per se, but He is concerned about us and our welfare. And money is how that occurs. Money buys clothes for your kids. Money helps the poor, you know. You can go down there and feed them if you're poor, but you can go down there and feed them if you're rich, you know. And, and, and so money is a tool, and God uses that tool in His hands through His children to first provide for their families and, and later to change their family tree, then to impact their community and even in, leave a dent in the whole thing out there in the world. And, and so when we abandon money because we see it as filthy lucre, or we see money as a bad thing and it's not spiritual, 
then, then what happens is the other side is the only side that has any money. And they get their work done on the earth. And that's not our job. We're to take dominion over things. That's very clear in Scripture. But, but money itself, just to pile it up and roll in it? No, that's not what we're talking about. Money's fine. Get you some. But it's not, it, it's not the deal. The deal is what it does. So good. Dave, there are so many people today that are hurting and deeply hurting. You're a strong Christian with a very committed faith in Christ. What encouragement would you have for those who are hurting financially today? You know, I, when Sharon and I were broke and bankrupt and our marriage was hanging on by a thread, we were about to kill each other. I remember that. It's like every nerve ending is raw. You just feel like, don't, don't touch me. You know, like you've been in a car wreck or something. It's just, it's awful. And the, now, all those years later, I look back and I see the trek we've been on. And the thing I remember is our life is not a snapshot. You're not stuck right there. Your life is a film strip. And so the next frame, something's going to change. And the next frame, something's going to change. And the next frame, something's going to change. Some of those changes are called God's blessings. Some of those changes are where you understand what you sow is what you reap. And so I figured out I had to quit sowing so much stupid because I was reaping desperate. Dave, I've been married 21 years, and you've been on the radio for 20 years. Is that right? Um, we were blessed enough to discover you when we were first married and got to be a part of one of the early financial peace classes. Um, I've now been through it many times and have helped facilitate it so many times. And it's truly, when you say it can change your family tree, it's changed me, it's changed our family, it's changed our church, um, I'm encouraging people like crazy to be a part of financial peace. From your perspective, what are the big wins that somebody's going to get when they go through this class? Well, thank you. We're so honored for your friendship and your partnership all these years, and for you to say those things about us is, is amazing. Thank you very much. The big wins are pretty simple. When you start getting control of your money, it forces you in order to do that to get control of other things going on in your life. And so we didn't realize it when we started, but now two million people later going through the class, we know that you're actually, a lot of people get their marriages healed and we're not a marriage counselor, but when you have to discuss everything about life on the budget, it makes you discuss everything about life. And we see families start to be able to deal with different kinds of boundary issues and toxicity. And, and we see even people lose weight because once you get control of one area of your life, it gives you the power and the hope to believe that you can do it in other areas. You don't feel so, uh, so, so lacking in power, so powerless. And so that's what I believe the big takeaway is. Yes, getting out of debt's important. Yes, being on a budget's important. Yes, tithing is important. And all of those things weave together, though, to create this holistic thing that it just blows your life up, man. It changes the way you do everything. And that's why we're so excited about it. Well, my life is different because of you, and I want to say thank you for your investment in my family, and thank you for your investment in our church over the years. We honor and love you. Ditto. We feel the same way about you, brother. Thanks. Okay. You hear me now? This is good? Through with the question and answer. Now, you know, I like what Dave just said about the more passion that you have to get out of debt, the more passion you have to get out of debt, then the deeper you'll go in sacrificing, the faster you'll get out of debt. And why is that important? You remember in week one, we talked about we do not serve money. We serve God. We're not going to be in bondage any longer to money. We don't want to be in debt any longer. We don't want to be enslaved by our debt. We don't want to do it. So I am praying that each and every one of you will take what we've learned over the past four weeks, plus today, five weeks total. I'm praying that you will take this seriously, that you will be passionate about getting out of debt. And you need to know that you can. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it if you will embrace self-control. Remember, say no now. Say no for a little while so that you can say yes later. If you will embrace the value of sacrifice, giving up something you love for something you love more. Giving up something you love for something you love more. And if you will plan, budget, take action steps, plan to get out of debt. It's not going to happen. It's, you're, you're not going, you may have stumbled into that debt, but you're not going to stumble out of it. You've got to have a plan to get out of that debt. Um, 
Once you're out of debt, once you get to that place and you are out of debt, then invest. Invest. Remember we talked about there's two ways to make money. You can work for your money or you can make your money work for you. Invest, invest, invest. But when you do invest, and Dave Ramsey just talked about it again, do not invest in things that you do not understand. Do not do it. And do not put all of your eggs in one basket. Remember that analogy about manure? You put all the manure in one place and you got this big stinking pile of poo. But if you spread it out, it makes things grow. It's fertilizer. You spread it out, it makes things grow. Don't put it all in one place. And then don't try to get rich quick. So many people have gone bankrupt because they tried to invest in such a way that they thought they would get rich quick. Don't do it. Do not try to get rich quick. And then last but not least, return the tithe to God. It belongs to Him. And trust Him. If you will give to Him first, if you will give Him your first and your best, He will bless the rest. He will bless, He will bless the rest. We don't want to steal from God. We want to honor God. So, what I want for you to do for me right now, I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I really, really want you thinking about what I'm going to ask you. I asked this question in week one. Some of you wasn't expecting um, what, what came about from that. So I want to know again today, are you tired of being in debt? Are you ready to be more faithful? Are you ready to honor God with your finances? Are you ready to be faithful in the small things so that He can give you bigger things to be faithful with for His glory on His behalf? Are you ready to be faithful in the small things so that He will bless you more so that you can do more on His behalf? Are you ready to honor God more? Let me see your hands if you are committing to honoring God with your finances. I see your hands. I see your hands. I see your hands. I see hands up everywhere. Let, let's pray. Father, I thank you today for all the hands raised and all the hearts surrendered. For those that have said, I want to honor you. I want to be pleasing to you. Father, I want to honor you with my money. And I'm so thankful that they have done that today. Where I, I pray. I've heard that there's some people who have said that they're tithing now. And I pray for those that hadn't been tithers, Lord, that they're tithing now for the first time because of this message. Lord, I pray that they will reap the benefits of experiencing your blessings, experiencing your faithfulness, and experiencing your goodness. Lord, I pray that they will see how much more you bless that 90%. Father, I pray that they will see how good you are to us. And Father, I pray that as we do honor you with our money and the tithe and the way we live by repaying our lenders and all of these things as we begin becoming unstrapped, Lord, I pray that we will remember that everything we have is for you, that we will give it to you. We will make it readily available for your purpose because you've given it all to us. You've given it all to us, Lord. We're just stewards over the things you've given us. So I pray that as we become unstrapped, that we will use the things you've given us for your glory, for your honor, for your kingdom, to advance your name, to make you famous in this world, to meet the needs of people that are far from you, and to meet the needs of people that are close to you. Lord, so that we can do what you've called us to do, so that we can be the church you've called us to be, so that we can develop immature believers, new Christians into mature believers, and so that we can be a light unto the world for Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you will bless us as we remain faithful, or as we begin being faithful with the small things you give us, bless us with more so that we can glorify you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for me. I'll just on my heart today, because we've been talking about debt so, so much, because I didn't really get a chance to preach today. It's just on my heart. That... All of us have a sin debt. For some of us, 
that sin debt has been paid for by the blood of Christ. But there may be people here today who have never had that debt paid for. They've never given their lives to the Lord Jesus. They don't even understand what it means to surrender to the Lord Jesus. They don't even know what Jesus came for. So, right now, I just want you to know that if you know that you are not right with God, if you know that you've been sinning, if you know that you do things that are not pleasing to a holy God, and you've never surrendered your life to the One who came, He came for you. He loved you so much that He came to pay that debt because He was the only one who could. The only one, the only sinless man who was fully God and fully man. He came and He lived a life. He lived a perfect life. And He gave up His life on the cross of Calvary for our sins so that by His sacrifice our debt could be paid. Paying off what we owe to God because we are not holy and God calls us to be holy. He gave His holy pleasing life. And all He asks for us is that we submit to Him as Lord, that we confess He is Lord, and He is merciful, He is gracious, and He is forgiving, and He will forgive us of that sin. Our debt will be paid for. So if you have never given your life to Him, but you believe that He came and He died for you, and you believe that on the third day He was resurrected, and you believe that one day He's coming back, and you want to say on this day, I choose this day, March 10th, 2013, to say, I'm tired of just knowing about you, but I want to know you. I submit my life to you, Lord Jesus. If that is you, let me see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. If you'll just pray with me. Father God, I'm a sinner. And I know that my sin separates me from you. But I know that your son Jesus came and he died on the cross for my sin. And Father, today I give my life to you. I want my debt paid for. I want to know you. I want to encounter you. I want to live a life for you that is pleasing to you. Forgive me of my sin and fill me with the presence of your spirit so that my life can be set aside to glorify your name. I belong to you, Lord Jesus. I'm yours. It's in your holy name that I pray. Amen. Let's have a round of applause for one who prayed that prayer with me today.